this content is brought to you by Algorand, which is the official sponsor of the Thinking Crypto channel and podcast. Algorand is building the technology to power the future of finance. The convergence of traditional and decentralized models into a unified system that is inclusive, frictionless, and secure. It is founded by Turing award-winning cryptographer Silvio McCalley. Algorand has developed a blockchain infrastructure that offers the interoperability and capacity to handle the volume of transactions needed for DeFi, financial institutions, and governments to smoothly transition into future five. The technology of choice for more than 700 global organizations, Algorand is enabling the simple creation of next generation financial products, protocols, and exchange of value. For more information, please visit algorand.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto channel, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Alex Pruden, who's the Chief Operating Officer at Alio. Alex, great to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Alex, I'm very excited to learn about Alio and the different type of solutions you're bringing to the table as it relates to privacy. But before we get there, uh, let's talk about where you're from and uh, where'd you grow up? Yeah, sure. I grew up in Southern Arizona in a town called Tucson, about an hour north of, uh, of uh, the Mexican border. Um, yeah, that's, that's my, where, I, where I call home. Uh, today I live in Montana, so slightly colder, colder climb. Um, and you know, as far as your background, uh, I read that you spent some time in the army. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, uh, I grew up as part of a military family. I am actually the fifth generation member of my family to serve in the U S armed forces. And I was in high school when nine 11 happened, kind of inspired me to go serve and kind of follow in the footsteps of prior generations. Um, so that was 2003, 2000 or 2004, sorry, where I, when I started the, the United States military Academy, commissioned as an officer. And, and then I went to Afghanistan as part of the surge, uh, leading an infantry platoon in 2010. And then I, you know, wanted to try out for special operations. And I did that. And I, and I, you know, earned my green beret in 2013 and then joined a, you know, the special forces group in 2014 and the mission for, you know, a lot of people may not know this, but, you know, green berets in the army are kind of like the whole, the whole mission, is to train other forces to fight, you know, you know, to, you kind of train them and fight alongside them. And so the motto, the motto is by, with, and through. Um, and there's, this is relevant to crypto and maybe we can get to that in a minute, but I guess, yeah, quickly, I, I did three years in special operations and at the tail end of uh, my time, I got interested in cryptocurrency specifically through my work with the Syrian rebels in, uh, in 2016. Wow. Well, first, uh, thank you for your service. And maybe you can tell us about that, how, how you, that, you know, you came across a Bitcoin or crypto and what got you interested in it. Yeah. So um, to me, right, really the key moment was, um, you know, witnessing the Syrian civil war and, you know, obviously the loss of life is, is of course the biggest tragedy. I mean, you know, like the hundreds of thousands of people who died, you know, and, and all of that is, is I think the big, the real tragedy, but I think a tragedy uh, of proportions that people don't always appreciate is the loss of wealth that resulted from people being displaced. Um, you know, so fleeing from a war-torn country, you know, oftentimes people didn't, you know, first of all, people, many of whom didn't necessarily pick a side, they just so happened to be on one, the, they happened to be on the wrong side of whatever, you know, front line they were nearest. And, uh, and, you know, they had to make often very snap decisions of like whether or not to stay or leave. And many of them left thinking that the war would be over tomorrow and they would come back whenever, you know, when either the rebels took over or the government took back over, depending on what kind of affiliation they had and, you know, everything would be back to normal. And, uh, you know, of course they left with, you know, a minimum, the minimum of possessions and certainly didn't take time to go and stop at a bank or something to try and like empty their entire savings accounts. Uh, and even, and of course, many, many people didn't even have that much physical, you know, or, you know, wealth in a bank account. It was you know, stored in like property or something like that. So anyway, these people fled, ended up in refugee camps. Of course, the conflict dragged on and on. I mean, 
in, in many ways, it's still kind of simmering. And, and there's still millions of displaced people I, in Jordan and Lebanon and Turkey. And, uh, you know, again, they, they basically lost access to the wealth that they had saved and accumulated over the course of their lives, right? And these are people, people who I interacted with kind of in the course of training, you know, some of them who became Syrian, you know, who, who joined like the rebel forces. Um, you know, these are doctors, lawyers, mechanics, like, you just, there's average people like anywhere else in the world, you know, have, having jobs and want the same things as anyone else, which is like, I want to save up for a house. I want to save up for my kid's college. And, you know, of course, and then they find themselves destitute in these camps and they, they really have no, they have no economic prospects and they have no way to start over because all of their accumulated wealth is gone. And the only way to get at it is to go back into a conflict zone where they, again, risk their lives and the lives of their families. And uh, I, I, so I heard about Bitcoin so you know, I'm in this context and I, I heard about Bitcoin from kind of a few different people in, in different contexts, you know, uh, you, you know, and mostly as like, a, you know, just kind of people who are, had a hobby of investing and they're like, hey, Bitcoin, it's going to be huge. You should buy some. And, you know, I wasn't, you know, I, I didn't come from a computer science background or a technical background at all. Um, so I, I was kind of like, OK, that's interesting that, you know, finally someone convinced me to kind of look at it. A little more deeply and and i was finishing up that last deployment as i said in 2016 and i read the bitcoin white paper mm. and really just the the idea to me what really stuck was this idea that you can have your bank it's effectively bitcoin is your bank account but in your head right you the mat the power of cryptography is such that like you memorize the seed phase seed phrase that corresponds to the private key um or, or the, you memorize the private key you memorize the secret that only you know, and then that effectively is the key to your bank account. And number one, you take that with you anywhere you go. And number two, no one else can take it from you. And this idea of liberty in a financial sense, again, given what I experienced from the, you know, from the Syrian civil war, to me, it was like really powerful. I was basically thinking to myself, like if these people had their wealth in this form, they could walk, uh, they could just grab all their things and go across the border to safety and then decide they're like, I've got to start over somewhere else, but Hey, I have at least my life savings right here. Now, of course, that's, that's like the romantic vision. And, you know, of course there's all kinds of practical obstacles to that, but nonetheless, I think the idea is incredibly powerful and that aspect of it was what got me interested in crypto. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, being able to self custody and like you said, have, have your, be your own bank, uh, and be able to store your wealth in something that can be accessed anywhere, as long as you have like internet connection or whatever it may be. That's, pretty powerful and something that hasn't existed uh, before. Um, now you went to work for Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. How did you end up there? Uh, yeah, so I guess maybe to connect the dots between where I ended and you know how I got to A16Z. So I got out of the, I, so once I got, once I read the Bitcoin white paper and kind of got more and more into the space, I, I decided I really wanted to find a job in the industry. Um, you know, I was, an, I was an army guy. I didn't have any technical experience. So I was trying to figure out how to break in. I was kind of taking some coding classes at night and I thought to myself, maybe I'll apply to some grad school programs because, you know, the, in, in the U.S. you have the GI Bill, which will fund it. Uh, so I was like, OK, I'm going to apply to some schools. Um, I didn't think I was going to get into a top tier like computer science program. So I was like, maybe I could go and go to business school and then just kind of moonlight over like the computer science school or kind of these other in, in these other, you know, parts of the university where I could learn, kind of really become, all, you know, completely educated in like everything having to do with cryptocurrency. So that was kind of my plan. And I was very fortunate to apply to and get into Stanford University, where I spent two years in the MBA program. And when I first got there, timing is for, for somebody who had a goal of breaking into the space, like the timing couldn't have been better. Because I showed up, I helped, you know, start what was initially called the Stanford Blockchain Collective ended up becoming the Stanford Blockchain Club at a time when 2017, you probably remember this was the ICO boom, Ethereum, like it had really the first real wave of interest in smart contracts and dApps really started. In fact, it's funny, you know, NFTs are like really all the rage now, but you know, CryptoKitties, CryptoKitties was like the first one of those that I remember again as the, as the you know, as you know, when we started this club, that was like kind of in vogue. Anyway, so I, I I got involved kind of on campus and those things. 
and you know kind of through some connections from other students um i, I got connected with uh an investing firm or an investment firm called ggv capital which is you know silicon valley you know a, a venture capital firm like a16z and i worked as an analyst there covering crypto and they took an amazing chance on me again i had no <laughs> i had no professional experience i was just like into it and but they took a chance on me which i really appreciated and i, I worked with them i learned a lot about investing from them through them i got connected to coinbase where I be, you know, became an intern on um, on the corporate development team and did that for which, you know, corporate development kind of similar to investing in some ways. I did that between my first and second summer, was planning to go back to that. And then, uh, yeah, but, but recall, like I said, my plan was to kind of moonlight in the computer science school and like learn stuff. And so I was, um, I was taking classes that I frankly had no business being in over there, like including some in, you know, master's level cryptography courses and in one of those courses, uh, I, I was getting ready for class one day. I got an email from the professor and he's like, I want to talk to you after class. And I was like, oh, okay, I must have failed something. <laughs> this is about to be the end of my <laughs> experience in this course. And um, and uh, the guy turned out to be an advisor to A16Z, unbeknownst to me. Uh, his name is Dan Bonet. He's a he's actually a pretty prominent cryptographer. Um, and he, he advised A16Z. He's like, hey, they're hiring for a data analyst. You know, you're you're the only business student in my class. Maybe you'd be interested in this. You know, and I was kind of very flattered and kind of shocked because again, I thought I was going to fail the course or something. So, um, long story short, that's how I got connected to A16Z. Had a number of conversations, which culminated in a conversation with Katie Hahn, who was one of the two general partners of the fund uh, at the beginning, and this is in 2019 now. And uh, she she made me an offer to join the firm as a deal partner. So I joined uh, as a deal partner, uh, investing partner on the A16Z crypto crypto team. And I spent about uh, just under two years there, um, which was what I did right before I joined Alia. Wow. Uh, pretty amazing. And, you know, A16Z is such a big name uh, when it comes to investing, not just in crypto, um, but obviously they're doubling down now in crypto, but certainly in the tech space, uh, Mark Andreessen, Ben Horowitz at Netscape, Web 1.0. Uh, so pretty cool. Um, was there any interesting takeaways from your time there and, and working amongst those folks? Uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I think I really, you know, as you mentioned, like Mark Andreessen, Ben Horowitz, you know, there were other folks, um, you know, who I worked very closely with on the crypto team, including Chris Dixon, Katie Hahn. I mean, it was, I think to me, it was, it was special because all of these are very high achieving people, uh, and accomplished, but they all, I think have very unique talents and, and very, and they're very unique in how they became successful and the and the things that made them successful, um, like for example, Chris is you know one of the smartest people I've ever met, and his his ability to just see kind of the future really and articulate it in a way that's very compelling is just unlike anyone I've ever seen. Um, you know, as a and contrast that with Katie, who's the other general partner who I work more directly with, who just had a very very she was very savvy at execution and very much of all about building and maintaining and cultivating a vast array of relationships, which she could leverage to, you know, get into the, get into the next hottest deal. Right. So it's like very different skills, both equally important. And it was, it was cool to be able to be around um, just people like that. And, and I learned an amazing amount about investing, about leadership, about cryptocurrency, um, yeah. So for me, I mean, yeah, that's that that was to me the, the real takeaway from my time there. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Um, so I have to ask, you know, what do you hold in your crypto portfolio? <laughs> oh man, well, I, I see I'm safe here because you know, Alio, our blockchain is not live yet. So I, you know, I'm it's safe for I, it's safe for me to go uh, to to venture outside of the bounds of what I currently work on. Um so I'm most so yeah, I'm mostly uh interested. And kind of like, you know, the things you would expect, you know, I hold a lot of Bitcoin or not a lot of Bitcoin compared to some people, but I hold some Bitcoin, um, Ethereum, a lot of the project, you know, again, I got into the space kind of 2016, 2017. So a lot of my early investments were in like ICOs, <laughs> some of which I'm not proud to admit I was part of, but, you know, some of which actually did make a significant amount of money, you know, as I'm sure many of your, you know, viewers will appreciate. Um, but yeah, no, I, I've kind of over time, like, you know, collapsed down most of my holdings in terms of total, um, you know, dollar value to Bitcoin, Ethereum. And then the one other project that I'm very passionate about 
Um, if anyone knows anything about me or, or followed any deals I worked on before is Arweave. Um, so Arweave is a decentralized uh, protocol for, for uh, archival file storage. And I think I, I led the deal at A16Z. Um, and uh, I think it's just an incredible technology. It's an incredibly creative use of, um, yeah, of, of a decentralized network and a blockchain to accomplish a different goal than just a financial system. So I, yeah, I, I don't know. So for me, that's the one that like, if it weren't Alio that I was working on, I'd be, you know, I'd be just deep down the rabbit hole working on stuff in the RWE ecosystem. So I'm just a, a really big fan of, of that community. So let's talk about Alio. Um, give us the full rundown, the history, what's the mission, how it works and so forth. Yeah, sure. So um, I guess I, the, the simple bumper sticker version is Alio is a platform for private applications. Hmm. Um, you know, I noticed that I didn't qualify for web three or anything like that. I mean, I think, you know, in general, I think privacy is something that's important. It's certainly important in the world of, of cryptocurrencies, like kind of the, the web three as we kind of consider it today. But even beyond that, I think privacy is incredibly important in a world where increasingly our interactions are digital in nature. And why, and arguably I think it matters more, like it matters more than people might appreciate especially because often we're used to interacting with each other in the physical, in a physical environment where things are by nature ephemeral, right? Like for example, this conversation we're having right now, if you and I were in person and assuming you're not secretly recording it, right? Like the sound waves that are projecting out of my mouth are going to dissipate. Like, you know, it's not like, it's not like you're capturing them forever and you can like always piece together this conversation. Like it's like our lives, like our experiences are kind of ephemeral very naturally. And I think, our society has evolved around that kind of concept. Whereas digitally, like this conversation, I mean, of course this is being recorded, but in general, any information you send over the internet, like it kind of exists in this quantum state. <laughs> is, it, is it forever saved somewhere or is it gone for, and it's like, it, you kind of never know whether something exists or doesn't exist. And, you know, it's possible to learn an incredibly rich amount of detail about a person just by picking up little clues and breadcrumbs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think maybe some people don't, may, may, may or may not be concerned by that. I mean, I think people should be more concerned than they are because, you know, again, people can say, and we've seen this with big tech companies that, you know, use AI and machine learning to kind of target advertising. And, and you know, some people even allege that like, you know, Facebook and the way the, you know, the algorithms worked, you know, affects elections around the world, right? I mean, it's right. like, and, and this is all possible because of these breadcrumbs that we ourselves leave kind of in these, you know, in these digital spaces. And so I think privacy and, and caring more about what data we share and we don't is, is very, very important. And, uh, and this, that's really the premise upon which Alia was founded. Um, so, okay, so maybe in a little more detail now, so what is it? So Alio is a full stack platform for developing building and running private applications. And we're doing it using blockchain technology. So at the, at the very bottom layer, I get the way I kind of like to describe it is in layers. Um, the very bottom layer is, is a blockchain. So there's a decentralized network, you know, decentralized network of nodes that, you know, come to consensus. Actually, the consensus is very similar to how Bitcoin works with one caveat that we can come back to later. Um, but that's, that's kind of the base layer. And this is, this is where kind of data about different applications is stored and where state is kind of managed. Uh, the second layer on top of that is what we call snark VM, and this is the execution layer. Um, I want to call out here, there's a, there's a difference between how Ethereum works and how we're architecting Alio to work. How Ethereum works is like, I want to do a trade on Uniswap. I like basically package up some data about what I want to do and sign it. And I send that to, you know, I, I send that as a transaction on chain. And then the miners collectively, actually every node on the network collectively processes that. So they, so everyone executes the same thing in parallel. Hmm. Um, not only is it very inefficient, but also you have this problem where Uniswap being a great example, where like, hey, I see a great arbitrage opportunity. Like, hmm, I'm going to take that. You know, I'm going to send a transaction. Now, the problem with the current model of Ethereum at least in this context, is that everyone in the world or every every node gets to see that, look at it, think to themselves, that is a good deal. 
and I'm going to take it, right? You know, and this this is this is a concept called front running and minor extractable value. And people have quantified the amount of money that has been lost in this way. Um, and uh, and so anyway, so the execution model that Alio uses is fundamentally different. What we do at the second execution layer is actually client side. I don't just send data to the chain. I compute a zero knowledge proof about a program, about, you know, basically I run a program, compute a proof about the program, submit the output of the program and the proof to the chain. And then the miners look at it. There's no opportunity for front running because effectively all of the, the information is encapsulated inside of the zero knowledge proof. So to the miners, they're like, okay, one is like the other is like the other. So, okay, whatever transaction fees highest I'm going to take. So there's no opportunity for minor check value, one. Two, it's much more efficient because instead of having every miner and every node in the network rerun every program for all time, you run it once as a client, you could generate the proof. And then a miner, again, if you, you know, you've, you've got to put, you know, some faith in cryptography, which I guess is to say you have to put some faith in math. Yep. Um, you know, the miner can just look at it and say, hey, this, I can verify this proof. I trust this computation was done correctly. And then they can process that state update. So that's kind of the middle level. And that's, I think, really what distinguishes us from a lot of other blockchains, which is why I wanted to spend a little time talking about that specifically. And it, it kind of at a higher level is we also have a programming language uh, called Leo, which is all about writing programs that, you know, you can deploy on Alio, on SnarkOS, on our, on our kind of blockchain network that then you interact with via transactions in this execution layer that I just described. But Leo is like the equivalent of Solidity you know, kind of the same way as like as a developer, it's your primary entry point into this ecosystem. And then on top of that, you know, we've got kind of like the, the other interfaces to the chain. We have a studio where you write Leo programs and deploy them directly. We have, you know, we'll have a wallet that you as a user, you're like, okay, I'm going to navigate somewhere and in, you know, the Alio web and I'm going to like do something. I'm going to pay, you know, I'm going to send you money or something like that. Um, we, and we have a block explorer that, you know, it's basically an interface for people to kind of look at the chain and figure out you know, hey, did my transaction go through or something like that? Um, so I'll pause there. That was a lot. Uh, as you can, pro as you probably picked up, there's there's a lot going on here, and uh, fully acknowledge it's a very ambitious project. But I'll pause there and see if you have any questions about any aspect of it, or if you want to go a different direction. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, my one question I have, and I absolutely agree with you with privacy and and the need for that, and for certain uh, transactions and so forth. How are you guys finding the balance of providing privacy solutions and compliance with uh, regulators with KYC, AML? Can you tell us about the balance there and, and how you're navigating that? I love this question because I, I think it's the easiest one to answer. Um, and the reality, like the, I think to me, if I could summarize the breakthrough of zero knowledge cryptography, it's that it solves what previously was a dilemma between transparency and privacy, right? Like it's sort of like I could either be, I could either hide some information for you from you, or I could show it to you, right? It's like, let's pretend we're playing poker. I could like, you know, it's like, Hey, I have five of a kind. And you're like five, there's not even five in the deck. You know what I mean? It's like, I mean, you can't prove that I don't unless I show it to you. Right. So there's like, inherently there's this, like, there's this, there's this trade-off. Right. And again, you know, maybe the five of a kind of poker example is silly, but you can imagine like for compliance, for example, like really to comply, you know, for example, banks to comply with KYC and no regulations requires large compliance teams to, in many cases, like physically verify that something took place or it didn't. And the nice thing about zero knowledge cryptography is that I can keep my hand, my poker hand private, but I can prove to you that I have certain cards without revealing what they are. In fact, it's even better than that. I can prove to you that I have a certain combination of cards without rec without without revealing what that what the individual cards even is. And so if you think if you apply that to a world of compliance, this is this is the framework that I think every regulator should love and embrace because you can effectively do something like hey, let's have a let's have a central bank digital currency stable coin type thing. And we're just going to bake in like, hey, if you're on a sanctions list or if you're on a KYC AML blacklist, like there's just, you can't transact, right? And it's like, and every single entity in, in the network won't be able to send a transaction to those entities because they have to prove that they're not, right? If, if, if that they are one of the counterparties like that, it basically takes care of it. So if you, it, it happened, the compliance effectively becomes automated and therefore it is, becomes more effective and 
saves an enormous amount on costs. And then lastly, I, I guess the last thing I'll say is, you know, for, for those of you who are more educated in, in like, zero, you know, those of your viewers who are more educated in kind of zero knowledge proofs and how they work is like, there's a concept of a view key wherein I can kind of selectively reveal some or all of the data that's encapsulated inside of this proof. Uh, but I don't have to reveal all. Like, it's not an all or nothing thing. Like the previous example, we talked about, you know, communication over the internet. Like, I kind of I don't have a choice. I have to basically reveal everything. I send a form online. Everybody, whoever's on the other end, whoever that is, sees all of it, right? There's no way to like hide some from different people. Um, so I, I think a short answer is I think regulators um, will embrace this technology. And this is actually why the Federal Reserve, when they're, you know, look, the Federal Reserve is looking at launching a CBDC and they're partnering with MIT to do it. And MIT is I mean, basically MIT is where all of this research came from. And they're looking at leveraging this technology in, in that future um, for, for that future uh, initiative. Wow. Um, so, and I want to make sure I wrap my head around this. And I, so your the, the solution you're bringing, is it uh, interoperable with other blockchains and can it be applied on top of other blockchains and in itself also its own respective chain? Yeah, in the same way that every chain can interoperate with every other one, like Solana, for example, you know, has the wormhole bridge to Ethereum. Um, you know, there's, of course, because Ethereum doesn't exist inside of Solana, there's like, you know, there's arc, there's certain architecture that has to happen where you it, you may not quite have the same trust guarantees that you do when executing a program natively on Solana. So these like the concept of bridges comes into play. So we can bridge to other chains, and in some ways it's actually easier for us to bridge to say Ethereum or Solana or Celo or, you know, pick, take your pick, you know, because, because of the model that we have where you compute a program off chain and verify it on chain, it sort of makes us as a universal adapter uh, on our end to be able to bridge to other different ecosystems. So absolutely Alio can fit on top of SOT next to around, um, you know, Different, different other um, chains. And that's that's actually one of our goals as a project is we want to be thought of as a private settlement layer. Mm. You buy an NFT on Solana, you want to like, maybe you want to bridge that over to Polygon or something. You transmit it through Alio effectively, like the, your identity, you're able to like reclaim privacy or, or, you know, in some ways like reclaim, you know, mix effectively like the fact that you own this one and maybe, and maybe you can like, uh, you know, achieve privacy for yourself once you come out the other side uh, in Polygon or whatever network. Got it. So if I wanted to buy a ridiculously priced NFT, I don't know, a $69 million NFT and I want to keep it anonymous, I uh, I could use Alio to help mask or, or you know keep my privacy, so to speak. Yeah. And in the same way, like, like you buy a ridiculously expensive piece of art, right? And like, you know, your wire transfer and, you know, it's like your bank, you send a wire transfer and it's like, you know, your bank, you know, and in this case, the bank, AKA the network wouldn't even know, but you know, in the case of a wire transfer, certainly the world doesn't know. Right. And this is like, it's kind of the weird thing about if like privacy in web three specifically today, where it's like, I mean, I, you can go to my Ethereum address and not only can you see everything, I mean, you asked my question about what do I own? I mean, you can just see it. You can go to it right now and find out. And then on top of that, you can see everything that I've ever bought ever. Right. And you think about like, think about the implication of that. I mean, I, people kind of don't care because I think right now it's a, it's a little bit of a speculative phase. I think this technology, but if you think about applying this and like, let's say you're running a business, I'm a supplier, you're negotiating with the other suppliers, like, it's pretty awkward if I can see every, every other contract you've ever had, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, anyway, so I think, I think the second people start thinking about this and, and applying real economic use cases, you know, you, you get to this point very quick, which is why, by the way, like the big banks that have explored this technology, JP Morgan, um, uh, well, EY, like these big enterprises that looked at it, like very quickly, they start going down the rabbit hole of ZK because it's really the only viable option uh, to marry it to the real economy that exists outside of crypto. Now, who are your uh, target use cases or customers? Would it be uh, both like enterprises and also like retail? Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, short answer is probably like every other crypto project that's ever come on is developers. <laughs> developers come build applications to do all this. Thing. But I guess 
the question I'm going to take your question and, and I think the, the spirit of it was like what use cases would do you think about for Alio? Sure. Um, and we, you know, we kind of think of three specifically that um, so first of all, I guess let me just say Alio, we don't consider Alio as an ETH killer or a Bitcoin killer or a Zcash killer or a killer of anything. It's it my belief and the belief of the co-founders and, and the team broadly is that this is going to be a multi-chain world, mm. going to have different architectures that are kind of optimized for individual use cases. And, you know, value is going to kind of flow between those. Maybe it'll flow through some exchanges. Maybe people will use Alio as a private settlement layer. Maybe they'll be in a Cosmos type version. I don't know. Like, bottom line is there's going to be multiple ecosystems out there. And we don't pretend to be the best at every single use case. Now, I do think there are a lot of use cases that are, you know, we potentially might, you know, offer a lot of value in. And, and I think certainly anywhere that privacy is important, which I would submit is a lot more places than people think. Uh, you know, I think this is an area that we we feel we would be better suited for applications that kind of have have that in mind. But I think very specifically and tangibly to your question, um, three areas we kind of think about are DeFi, gaming, and identity. Um, I mean, I'd go through them. So DeFi, basically for the reasons that I outlined earlier, talking about front running and minor extractable value, you know, if you want to run like an OTC desk or a dark pool or something where it's like large, large, you know, people coming in with large orders, limited number of counterparties in amounts that could potentially materially move the market one way or the other. Uh, you know, you don't want like that information. You don't want that to be public, right? Which is why all this happens off chain. Um, you know, speaking from experience at A16Z, like, you know, I saw this, like a lot of these big, you know, a lot of these assets get traded in large volumes off chain that far, far, far exceed what, what is shown on chain. For this exact reason, people want to move market, et cetera. Right. Um, so, that, so I think, you know, you could do, it's, it's really hard, arguably impossible to create something like a OTC desk type thing, something like that on Ethereum. But you could do it very easily in Alio, so it's it, it's it's, uh, it's it's achievable. So I think something like that private DeFi um, is is something that we we kind of look at and are excited about. Um, gaming is is maybe a little bit counterintuitive, but um, but we were really inspired by um, an, a DAP on ETH, which I don't know if you or your viewers know of, but if not, you should check it out. It's really cool. It's called Dark Forest, and uh, it's kind of like a space themed strategy game and it uh, entirely uses zero knowledge proofs for like you as a player basically submit zero knowledge proofs about where your next move is going to be and you do it in that way so you you hide where your where your ships are from the other players kind of in the universe right and it's a really cool and interesting concept um in crypto because if you think about how ethereum works like playing like an even simpler example is take chess versus battleship like chess you know, we play a game of chess. There's not really, I mean, all your pieces are in front of me. Like you can see everything, right? But a game like Battleship, so to chess, you can usually do on Ethereum. A game like Battleship though, where it's like you put your ship somewhere, I shouldn't know where they are. Like that, again, in, in Ethereum, it's very hard to do that, right? Because every, again, everything's public. Um, and this is what we call a hidden information game. And so I think this category of decentralized hidden information games, it could potentially be, a huge category for the same many as like forget the hidden information for a second like just decentralized games in general i'm super bullish about i mean look at the success of like axie infinity and the many many other kind of game by projects that launched this year i mean like people are catching on to this idea that like gaming being ver being a virtual space to begin with is very compatible with web3 and kind of cryptocurrencies so you can like marry all kinds of financial things into it you can have DAOs that own games, et cetera. And I think what like the hidden information piece gives you is it expands the category of games that you could play, which in my mind makes it a lot more fun where it's like, you know, we're playing a card game. I don't want to know what cards you have. And like, it makes it more exciting and fun to have that hidden information component. So sure. um, that's, that's, that's sort of how we, so gaming is one area that we're excited about. Uh, and then lastly, identity. Um, and a lot of people have talked about self-sovereign identity for a long time. Uh, where it's, and the idea is just very succinctly, you know, I want to re reveal something about my background, like the, maybe the fact I have a credential, maybe the fact I went to a military academy or to Stanford to someone, but I don't want, I don't want like you to learn everything about me just by revealing that one credential, right? So 
sure. you kind of selectively reveal certain aspects of yourself. And uh, that's the idea of self-sovereign identity. It's very, very much fits with the paradigm of how, how we're building Alio. Um, all those use cases absolutely make sense. Um, and you're, it's certainly, I, I just remember conversations over the years about, look, Bitcoin is pseudo anonymous and, and some of these other cryptos as well. They're not fully anonymous. There's certain information that's hidden, but still there's still a, a missing level of privacy. And I think uh, this certainly brings it to the table. Um, tell us about the Alio token and tokenomics around that. Yeah, so it's actually relatively straightforward. Um, you know, the Alio token is issued to miners who produce blocks on the network in the same way that Bitcoin is issued, right? So starting issue, the starting supply of Alio tokens is going to be a billion credits. Um, and then there'll be an emission curve that halves every three years for the first nine years. And then there'll be a tail, a final halving. So there'll be a fourth halving and then a tail emission um, out, uh, um, you know, in, into perpetuity. So 12 and a half credits will be emitted per block in perpetuity, which of course is a percent of total approaches zero over time. Um, so, and, and the schedule, and I'm recalling this from like, you know, the document that we wrote up, but uh, and which is on our blog, by the way, if anyone's curious, uh, alio.org, you know, you can go and find our blog and this information is there. Um, but yeah, as I recall, the inflation schedule starts at 100 credits are emitted per block, 50, 25, and the final halving takes it to 12 and a half. The purpose of the token is to pay transaction fees to include like your, basically your proof transactions onto the network. So in the same way that Bitcoin is used effectively. Um, kind of maybe one interesting wrinkle here is like there's a duality between um, mining on the network and what we call proving services. So one thing that we haven't touched on is like this idea that like, hey, a client has to produce a proof to send a transaction. And a question you should be asking is like, wow, zero knowledge proof sounds like complicated cryptography. Like, can my smartphone do that? And the answer is like, yes, just not very fast. <laughs> So like, you know, for some low power or kind of devices with it maybe a little bit more limited, like there's kind of a, a mode by which you can submit transactions, which is similar to how Ethereum does meta transactions. If you're familiar with that concept, it's kind of a little bit older, but where it's basically like, I kind of sign my intent uh, or I delegate a part of the proof generation process to a third party that maybe has a cloud full of servers of specialized hardware for this exact purpose. And then they submit the transaction on my behalf. And, you know, there's ways to ensure that they can't steal funds, right? For example, if I sign the data beforehand or if like I only reveal part of it, not the whole thing. Anyway, so bottom line is there's, we envision like this world by which there's not just clients interacting directly with the network, but also these provers as a service that clients maybe kind of uh, congregate around that are then submitting and batching transactions to the network. In a similar way, like the ZK rollup works, uh, where like ZK rollup is like, hey, there's a bunch of people on the rollup chain they submit proof or they submit their transactions to the operator. The operator rolls them up into a zero knowledge proof and then they submit that on chain. So anyway, I guess the point I was making about the economics is miners will probably do this as, you know, they, they miners and provers might be two sides of the same thing. They'll do whatever's optimal. They're like, can I earn more tokens from being a prover? Can I earn more tokens from being a miner? And they'll switch between those modes, we think. Got it. Um, tell us about the investments you've gotten. Uh, I read you got an investment from A16Z, Andreessen Horowitz, and uh, maybe some other investors. If, if there are, um, you can give us the details around those. Yeah, sure. So uh, let's see. So we've uh, raised um, three rounds, three rounds of funding so far. So the pre-seed, which was at this when Alio started in late 2019, um, that was uh, led by Decrypt Capital, which is Howard Wu, who's our CEO, CTO, and, and basically the inventor of this of this paradigm, uh, you know, he came from there and they, they preceded the project um, and they've been great partners. Our seed round was led, and this is in 20, summer of 2020, uh, it was led by Polychain Capital. And uh, it was great, great to include uh, Slow Ventures on there as well as some other folks, A Capital, et cetera. And then, uh, yeah, the, the round that you just referenced was most recently uh, in the spring, uh, A16Z led that round. Uh, and we had participation by placeholder uh, Galaxy Digital, Variant Capital, Ethereal Ventures, Coinbase, uh, a couple other angels, Balaji Srinivasan, um, you know, and some other folks like that. So, uh, so yeah, we're, we're very proud and humbled to have a, an amazing set of partners, not only investors, but a broader community, um, you know, which makes all this possible. For sure. 
Um, what's on the roadmap for 2022? Launching mainnet. <laughs> Most importantly, <laughs> launching yeah. mainnet. Sure. Yeah, so that's uh, that's that's really the main goal that we're that we're driving towards. So we're just kind of at the tail end of running our incentivized test net, uh, where we basically, you know, gave real rewards for miners out there who mine blocks, and so we can kind of validate some of our assumptions and, and our architecture with regard to consensus. Um, so that that concluded, I you know, arguably successfully or is, is concluding and it's been, we've learned a ton of great lessons. So it's been successful in that regard. And, uh, you know, we've got to build a little bit more infrastructure to make to make this dream and this vision and this architecture that I laid out to you a reality. You know, the wallet, for example, like we've got kind of a very basic one, but we need to build that out. We've got to do a little bit more work to connect like what, when you write a program in Leo to when you deploy it on Starcraft. Anyway, so there's like, there's still some stuff left to build. Uh, and that's going to be our focus for uh, the next two quarters. And then our plan is to launch mainnet in Q3 of this year. Awesome. I'm looking forward to, to that. Um, let's switch gears and talk about the crypto market at large. Um, I want to get your thoughts, given that you, you've followed Bitcoin and, and Ethereum and, and the market for a long time, uh, of the growth and adoption we're seeing uh, with corporates putting Bitcoin in their balance sheet, Bitcoin mining booming in the United States, El Salvador making a legal tender, you know, what are your thoughts and do you, do you expect uh, further growth this year as well? I mean, I'm a bull. I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm just, I'm just incredibly bullish on the sector generally. I mean, you know, I, I kind of jumped in head first to the space. And so I'm biased here because my answer is going to be, of course, there's going to be more growth. And, but I really do believe, you know, that, you know, you've, you, and I'm sure many of your viewers have been around the space long enough to know that the way it's going to progress is, you know, in kind of these waves, right? Where it's like, and we're kind of made, you know, it's hard to know where we are in the cycle, but you know, it's like, we're, we're certainly riding a wave that and are higher than we were two years ago, right? Where it's like, people kind of get excited and there's like all this new talent and new projects that rushes into the space. And then, you know, some people, you know, then there's a correction and people, some, some people are like, ah, this is just all a scam, I knew it. And then there's like a couple of years of like slow, hard times, which actually are my favorite times in the market because it's that's the time when you find the people who are really committed and dedicated and the projects which are really special and stand out. Um, you know, this like, for example, like the last couple of years, you know, everything that like everything in DeFi kind of came out of the last bear market, right? Which is like DeFi is arguably one of the biggest use cases for crypto. Lightning network, right? Like look at how huge lightning is becoming. And like, you know, that's been around for a couple of years, but man, the first year and a half or so, growth was pretty flat, but people stuck with it. And eventually like, you know, it just took a spark and then it started taking off and then you're riding the next wave. And so that's how these things progress. And so I anticipate we'll follow a similar curve here. Now, again, I don't want to speculate and you shouldn't take my advice if you think, if, if I tell you otherwise, that like I can tell you where we are on the wave. But, you know, bottom line is at some point it'll go up more, at some point it'll go down more. And, and but we're going to keep seeing this technology grow and become adopted. And I'm very convinced that um, in some way, shape or form, this is going to become the basis for financial markets in you know 50 years from now, just because it's so much cheaper and more efficient to do it this way. So hopefully, you know, look, you know, ending on a bullish note for Alio. Hopefully, Alio is part of that uh, fabric 50 years from now. But um, you know, I'm certainly passionate about it. But but yeah, I, I think the space is is definitely got nowhere to go but up. Now, you know, to to your point, we've seen a lot of growth and uh, a lot of progression from since years ago. Things have really moved at a rapid pace, in my opinion. Like for example, Lightning and so forth. But in the United States, there's still what, what some would consider some roadblocks or they're still trying to figure things out. We had uh, the infrastructure bill debacle. The SEC, they haven't approved the Bitcoin spot ETF. They're uh, suing certain altcoins and so forth, like Ripple, at, at XRP, Terra Luna, and so forth. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on the state of crypto regulations in the United States? And are you optimistic that maybe this year we, we see some clarity ar around anything other than Bitcoin, because I think Bitcoin has the clarity, but, you know, there's still. Yeah. Some... So I guess, first of all, first of all, let me just, you know, I guess maybe state, which is maybe I guess the obvious fact that, you know, I spent eight years of or nine years of my life in the U.S. Army deployed overseas, you know, so I think I've hopefully goes without saying that I, I consider myself a patriot in terms of like the United States. Um, 
And, uh, you know, and, and look, I, I'm, I'm also very bullish about the technology. And I don't, I don't always agree with the state of, of regulation. I think if any, you know, mostly I think the problem comes when there's a lack of clarity. Um, and, 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 but I am optimistic that, you know, there are more and more um, lawmakers and also regulators that get it and are trying to address it. And kind of a nice thing about the digital world in general, the internet, Web3, is that like they don't respect borders, right? These, this is a technology like the internet, like what does borders mean to the internet? I mean, IP addresses, but kind of like that, it's really like no concept of a border, right? So I think the nice thing about living in an interconnected world that's increasingly digital is like these ideas will find fertile ground to grow and to develop, right? Like El Salvador, right? It's a small country, take a, arguably a big risk to move their financial system part in part over to this, but could pay off, right? And if it pays off, like others will look at that and say, hey, this could be a really good model. And and maybe at some point to whether it starts, you know, whether whether we're we're taking the lead on it or whether we're looking around and being like, hey, if we don't get on this train, it's going to leave the station. Either way, I think the technology is going to move forward. And um, you know, and that's what I ultimately what I ultimately care about. Um, but I am hopeful that, you know, as this technology matures, as real use cases start to materialize, um, you know, regulation will, um, you know, will kind of will come along with it. And by the way, I think one underrated thing, or you know, one thing that maybe people don't appreciate about these bills that are being debated in Congress, the infrastructure bill included, is like, in some ways, it's it's the most legitimizing thing that could happen, right? We're talking about, hey, we should tax some of this activity. I mean, I remember, I mean, it wasn't even that long ago where people talked about banning this entirely, right? And if you, as soon as it's something that's taxed, well, it's never going to go away, right? Because now it's a source of revenue for the government. And you could argue whether or not the tax is good or bad or whether the rules are wrong or right. But I think it's, in my mind, it's actually a moment of, of, of reaching some legitimacy that the crypto space really has never enjoyed until this past year. Yeah, no, I agree with you. That's a great point that we're on the radar now where we weren't before. And, you know, I think the saying first, they laugh at you, then they fight you and, and yeah. you gotta get it, then you win. Right. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we're in the fight phase where some of the incumbents and the legacy folks are fighting back, but uh, you can't stop innovation. You can't stop this disruptive tech. Um, but yeah, I mean, fundamentally, it's like I say, like the fundamental reality is like, it's just cheaper and faster and more efficient to do it this way. And, you know, you could argue about what's the micro level architecture that's better. And, you know, of course, and of course, I believe there needs to be sensible regulation. But like, you know, I, I think this is just it, it's it's going to get it's like this is going to this is going to happen because, again, like I think the fundamental reality is it's just it's a more efficient paradigm. Now, central banks around the globe are building their CBDC, central bank digital currencies and the United States also work in the digital dollar. What are your thoughts on these? Um, obviously, they're using the blockchain tech. Um, do you think CBDCs would be complementary to the crypto market? Um, and you know, you, I think you mentioned some stuff before about Alio potentially could help with with these things. Yeah, I think they're going to be complementary. I think you know it's a digital currency. I mean, of course, it depends under the regime that it's applied, right? Like you can imagine some very strict currency regime that only allows you to hold this digital currency, and like maybe it's a crime to hold Bitcoin or something. And so clearly, in that world, like the two are not complementary. So I think it, it sort of depends on the regime. But I think just in terms of the technology, I think they're absolutely complementary because I mean, just the idea of you know having some digital asset made in the form of a CBDC, you know, it's not, it's a, it's a shorter jump from that to a cryptocurrency than it is like a paper dollar <laughs> to a cryptocurrency, you know? Um, and by the way, I think even in a world where CBDCs become dominant, blockchains, I don't think will become obsolete at all because you still need to transmit value between these CBDC ecosystems. And there's like, uh, you kind of come back to this point of like, well, how does this decentralized network of countries like trust each other financially like wow kind of sounds like a blockchain all of a sudden you know what i mean so yeah. um so I, I view it as complimentary with the asterisk kind of caveat that like look i mean I'll, it, it definitely it definitely does depend on the regulatory regime and i i would personally advocate for one that's more open to innovation outside of you know some you know government issued currency a um, couple more questions here before we wrap it up. Uh, what are your thoughts on the NFT boom 
and how that's been taking off. And do you expect that to continue this year? It's almost like a branch off of the crypto market, but still obviously including cryptos and different blockchains. I think it's amazing. I mean, we talked about earlier in this conversation, CryptoKitties, you know, like I remember when CryptoKitties first started and it was, you know, it was an experiment at the time. It was kind of, it got a little hype, but you know, it kind of died off quickly. And, you know, the team behind CryptoKitties went on to found the Flow blockchain. And of course they're doing a ton of cool stuff with NBA Top Shot and like all the NFTs there. And it's just amazing to see how like from that small seed, like you have this enormous, like you said, branch off the tree. And, uh, and I admit that for a little while, I was a little skeptical of like, man, this seems like a lot of like, kind of um, intangible value, but I actually started, this is my personal revolution that I'm sharing. Like I kind of come around to, you know, actually maybe the hype is really justified. In fact, maybe I'm not bullish enough. And the reason for that is I was thinking about, I'm like, how could someone value a JPEG so much? You know, it's like to JPEG, it's like, how is this worth a million bucks? Like a copy, but like what I started thinking about and realizing was it, in the real world, actually people value intangible things. Yeah. all the time in an insane for you know for insane an insane amount of money like it's it's actually not a crypto thing that's like actually been the case for a long time right like i mean it, so there's like i mean art is kind of the most obvious example where it's like why is this, you know someone's painting worth millions of dollars i mean it does there's nothing tangible about it other than the fact like everyone thinks it's cool i don't know so so i kind of think nfts are like this the natural extension of that and, uh, and it also lets creators who maybe have been left out of like the traditional economy, like directly go to their fans or directly kind of monetize things um, in a way and in, in, in a more efficient, more fair way to them. And, and they can earn revenue from like these creative things they could never earn in the traditional system. So I think it's, that's like something that I think is amazing about this, about the space. And then it also lets people do all kinds of fun and creative things. Like for example, us. So one thing I didn't talk about is, you know, zero knowledge proofs require a setup ceremony. So we basically had a setup ceremony that we had some, you know, community members contribute to. Anyway, we minted an NFT to give to contributors to the setup ceremony, right? And then of course, in the future, like holders of that NFT, like maybe we'll do some cool promotional stuff for them. Maybe they'll get like, you know, early access to some product. Maybe they'll get invited to a party at, you know, some crypto conference. I don't know, right? Like it's just kind of a cool, you know, it's a cool kind of token that like, you know, you can do a lot of things with. And, uh, you know, and like, like I said, I can't, who knows prices of any given NFT collection will go up, go down, who knows, up and down probably at different times. But I think the idea is, is actually just really cool and amazing. And like things that people don't even appreciate, like for example, accounts receivable on a balance sheet on an accounting statement, you could, you could actually create those as NFTs. Yeah. And like, that's like, there's all kinds of use cases for this. We're only scratching the surface. This is why I'm so bullish and excited about this space is there's like, God, it's like the internet in like the late eighties, early nineties, where it's like, we're, it's like, we've almost invented the browser and it's almost like, and we're at that point, you know, and again, I'm kind of old. I'm from, I remember that era. Like, and it's like, God, like it's unrecognizable what the world was like then versus what it's like now. And, in, in, and I think so there's so much, so many positive things to come. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned the perceived value and that, at first, at same way, I was a bit of a skeptic, like, uh, what is this? Then I'm like, wait a minute, the, the Pokemon cards I still have, it's a piece yeah. of cardboard, but the baseball cards, the basketball card, I said, it's a piece of cardboard that is people value at a thousand yeah. bucks or something. Yeah, exactly. I, I have like pictures sitting on my bookshelf. They're just, I mean, they're kind of random pictures of like scenery. It was like, I was like, hey, what I said, and it's like, would you just throw that away? No, I value it. So it's like, you just, I can't tell you why I value, but I do intangibly, right? And this is like the NFTs just capture this, right? Um, and I think that's that's what's interesting about it. All right, we're going to hit some wrap-up questions here. Um, if you could create your own metaverse, what would the theme be about? Oh, well, it's got to be sci-fi for sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I've, I've always been a massive sci-fi fan. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to think. I, I, I'd kind of go, I, I'd probably bounce between blade runner-esque like cypherpunk or like more gritty hard sci-fi-esque like the expanse kind of kind of vibe so uh but anyway i'm just revealing at this point that i'm a sci-fi fan so yeah i'm in my metaverse I, I i'm the same way like it's either uh blade runner for me or like some star wars 
like yeah. space theme, futuristic, not dystopian, but you know, futuristic at least. Yeah, yeah. So you got the black. I knew, I figured you got the black hole poster back there, which is cool. I, yeah, I actually it's, really. It's the Interstellar. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. I was about to say. I mean, so someone has rights to that, but I was about to say. I was like, you know, you could admit that as an NFT potentially. <laughs> I mean, I bid on it. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's a that's a good one. I should. I, that's a good idea. I should probably create that. Yeah. <laughs> Hurry up before your viewers get to it first. Yeah. <laughs> um, rapid fire questions. Favorite food? Um, I really like tacos. I'm a Mexican food guy growing up close to the border. Yeah. Favorite musician or band? Um, yeah, I really like bluegrass. So Trampled by Turtles. Um, it's kind of obscure, but yeah, I'm a, I used to live in Nashville, so I got really into bluegrass. Favorite movie? Oh, this is a tough one. It's between two new movies, both by the same director, the new Blade Runner or the new Dune. Honestly, I think the new Dune was just so amazing. So I, I honestly, I think those, I can't decide between them, but both those are probably my two favorites. Uh, favorite book? Um, I really like For Whom the Bell Tolls. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a liter, it's in a kind of a mid-century, mid-20th century literature. When you're not working uh, on Alio, uh, what are you doing for fun as a hobby? When I'm not working on Alio, I'm hanging out with my wife. When I'm not hanging out with my wife, I'm hanging out with my three kids. And when I'm not doing either of those things, that's not very much time. But uh, I like to, you know, I, I'm a gamer. So sometimes I'll jump on with friends and play some games. I like to read. Uh, and I do really like to learn and educate myself about stuff I still don't know, which is, you know, that's the great thing about crypto is as much as, you become an expert, you realize you also are an amateur every day and there's always more to learn. I, I really like kind of picking up books and, and learning new things. Alex, uh, pleasure chatting with you and I'm looking forward to the launch of the Alio mainnet and all the cool updates upcoming. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Hey, it was a great pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot for the conversation. Mm -hmm.